Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacor West, and I am delighted to be your host. Today, I have with me my good friend and esteemed guest, Jean Wesley Michel. Jean Wesley, say hi to everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> so, I'm super thrilled to have you on the show. And so, I'm going to tell our guests a little bit about you. So Jean Wesley is what I like to call a true Renaissance man. <laughs> Does all these things, um, things that I should backtrack and say we met in college and and just became fast friends. So I love that 20 years later that we get that, to do it together. Wow, it's been 20 years. It's been 20 years. I put that number out there for you. So take that. Wow. <laughs> do with it what you will. So yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. But I remember us meeting like yesterday you know, and just just all the good times, um, all the crazy college times. So it was just, it was really wonderful, especially too, because we were two Haitian American kids um, yes. you know, at St. John's University. Like that, that I think bonded us extra, which I loved because, you know, most of um, the Haitian kids I knew were my cousins. So it was always great to meet another friend who wasn't a relative. So you have just, and I don't want to say it like I'm somebody that's a million years older than you, but you have grown up to be, you know, all of these amazing things. And so one is, you know, a wine connoisseur, um, a travel enthusiast, a photographer, not to mention, you know, a father of two beautiful children. You know, I, I'm not going to ask how you do it all because I know that it has to be done. So that's all that is. But <laughs> I'm going to tell our guests a little bit about you. So on a daily basis, we can find you designing and turning ordinary spaces into functional homes and dream oases for your clients while working alongside top interior designers and architects in the city. And so when you're not designing, you're capturing moments as a photographer throughout the city and beyond. And be it personal or professional images from corporate headshots to city landscapes. And as somebody that has seen your work, I am always blown away at, at just how you can transform even an image that might seem mundane, like a building, while we're walking mm -hmm. by every day on the way to work, to something that is just an amazing and beautiful piece of art. Um, and also, um, you are a foodie, like myself, and so um, you say that food has always been near and dear to your heart, and so you love creating, capturing, and designing menus for simple or complex palettes. And so, as a wine enthusiast, um, you love pairing wines and food to make an event magical. So Jean Wesley, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm um, so I mean it's it's, it's 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 not um I mean this is this is like being back at Marillac Hall in St. John's, right? you know <laughs> um, in between classes, you know, trying to get something to eat and just catching up on the weekend or getting ready for the weekend. So this is I'm, I'm, I'm this is like being home. So thank you for having me. I'm telling you, I couldn't have said it better. It is, oh my gosh, Marillac Hall. He took it back there, everybody. I love that. Those were those were some amazing times and amazing days. I'm so excited to have you here, especially in this space. And while we've come a long way from Marillac Hall, I want to say that's not only in our journey academically, but our culinary journey as well. Because oh yeah, know, definitely, definitely. St. John's was okay, but that was college food, and now we're it, it, in a very different space. 
Absolutely. I think, um, so, um, I mean, thank you for reading my bio. You, you made it sound, you made my bio sound better than when I wrote it. <laughs> Everybody says that, but it's fantastic. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, no, I mean, I, I, um, I've actually, I, I actually, when I first started, you know, just um, putting myself out there, um, my bio was really mundane, very mundane. And I had to find, I had to find a, a bio that really, um, captured what I was doing, what I was into without sounding, you know, arrogant. Mm -hmm. But there's a there's a very fine line being between being arrogant and being accredited. Right. Of course. Of course. So I had to really, you know, I, I mean I'm very much proud of all that I've done at the age of 42 and I still have a lot more to do. Oh, yeah. Um so coming from St. John's, you know, living in Montreal, coming back to New York and now living in the DMV area, um, mm -hmm. you know, you learn a lot. And that's like that's like that's not even to, to touch on, you know, my travel, right? right? So, you know, one of the things that I have been blessed to have was parents that encouraged travel. My, my parents was not going to buy me the newest kicks. They weren't going to give me a car, even though I did end up getting a car. Um, but my summers consisted of, you know, being out of the country. And and up until now, you know, I, I, took, I took a hiatus from it. I after got married, um, you know, children, become a priority um but then again i was like listen i, I miss something and, and there's something about um there's something about travel that changes you and influences you yes yeah. right that is, um, that is exactly what i want us to talk about because you took a recent trip but don't get into that trip yet okay I mean, that just the pictures alone blew my mind and i was this is why i wanted you to be on the podcast today to talk about um this part of diversity and inclusion. And so mm -hmm. um, Global Fluency, as our listeners know, talks about all aspects of diversity and inclusion, right? And that includes like our differing experiences, our different, you know, culinary palettes based on culture, based on travel, based on just exposure to other people, other places and other things. But before we get even into that, I want you to tell me a little bit about your personal back background and your current occupation. Well, I started um, my current my 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 professional career um, took a, a three sixty turn. Um, when I was at St. John's, I was studying to be an education major mm -hmm. with a minor in English because I, I love to teach. Mm -hmm. um, but with me in, enjoying St. John's life too much, um, <laughs> my my career took uh, my career took a turn. So I got into um, education pretty early, you know, being a camp counselor, assistant teacher, and things of the like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and for a couple of years, I just thought that's what I, I wanted to do. And I stood along that path for a very, very long time. And ultimately, I ended up changing my major, mm -hmm. which had me be in school for another year. And I think that, and I think during that time, that's where you and I met, because I ended up doing an extra year yeah. at that point. So my, my major ended up changing from um, education to business administration with a minor in English. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's kind of, you know, the path that I kind of more or less stayed on. Um, I had a very um, interesting career in finance. And then, of course, you know, the infamous Black Monday hit. So I needed another job. I had to find a job quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I was just getting married. I had a, ki had a child on the way. And I needed something that was going to, you know, get me there. And I, I didn't have time to think about transferable skills at the time. But luckily enough, uh, thank God. I was able to get into into sales. Yeah, um, I got it was to, a natural to, progression. Thank it you. was, it was, and, and I didn't see the natural progression until um, probably my my second my second year in sales um, mm -hmm. when I was in Montreal, actually, very much so. So um, being in that, um, and not only sales, IT sales, you know, working with the, the likes of Lenovo, Dell, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. I was able, I was fortunate enough to work with two of the biggest companies in Montreal at the time from an IT perspective. So that was really, really good. It kind of um, gave me a good basis on to where I'm, I am right now. Mm -hmm. um, long story short, fast forwarding a little bit, um, I left Montreal um, and I just got tired of, of IT sales. Um, the, sales cycles, the sales cycles were too long. Uh, the money was good, but you were on call 24 seven, especially if you're dealing with other countries, different time zones, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm working from home or out on the road visiting clients, your time was not on the run. And I just didn't, I, I had enough and I just got burnt out. Um, ultimately, I ended up, you know, moving back to New York after my divorce um, and separation. And um, I finally decided to give retail a shot, but I didn't know how. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had a, a, a small but brief career 
at Bloomingdale's learning logistics. And I love logistics. I love to know how things work, how they're getting to where they're going to go, mm-hmm. who are the people. I, I enjoyed the back portion of it. But because of my personality, I was always meeting the, the key people who were the vendors, you know, the vendors from the back room. So again, a natural progression. And then um, a friend of mine has suggested to me you know, you should really continue this because this works for you. Like, you know what, man, you know, let me just, you know, I like being in the back, but the back didn't like me because I just kept on being drawn to the front, but again, because of my personality mm-hmm. um, and just being charismatic. So um, my ex-girlfriend had a colleague who worked at um, Crit and Barrel, and she's like, listen, if you want to just kind of get a forte in it, why not just try, you know, the sales aspect of it? And I enjoyed it. They gave me the opportunity to see the back end of it as well as the front end. And it was a, it was retail, but it was also my introduction to design. Right. Um, I was going to say, what a perfect place for you to be. So yeah. yeah so, so everything. Yeah. So, I mean, um, um, Crate and Barrel was for the first couple of years, for, I'm sorry, for the first couple of months, Crate and Barrel was overwhelming because it was literally a one-stop shop for everything. Um, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm thankful that I had an awesome manager who could kind of guide me um and if she's listening now patricia thank you very much for you know really really she was Haitian also too so she really you know gave me the inside scoop on what to do how to do it um Mm -hmm. client navigation and also coming from montreal to new york um the client base characteristic is different you know i I had been out of new york for almost 10 to 12 years um and i had lost touch with you know the client flow of things Mm -hmm. um I mean, New York is a different beast. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, right? So I had to really... Now, as an Atlanta now, like, it's so different. I didn't appreciate how different until I came down here. So I get Ex- Exactly. So <laughs> I had to really... Um, she literally threw me in the fire. I mean, what I thought would have been a, um extended um, training mm-hmm. turned out to be literally just on the floor and just go do it and meet people. And sometimes selling is just a natural conversation. Right. Um, and I, and I, I've got, I had to be, I've gotten better at it over the years and, and I just have to, you know, build myself up in that as a photographer, having an eye for certain things, I could see spaces before they were coming together. Oh, I love that. I love that. Right. That is not so, a skill I have, so I appreciate it in others, quite honestly. Exactly. So, so for me, a design consultant, cause I didn't go to school for it. So I can't, I don't necessarily, I don't like to call myself an interior designer. Mm-hmm. I prefer to say interior design consultant, but I can do what interior designers do, but, you know, I respect their craft. So I, you know, I went on from, you know, reading floor plans, you know, Adobe Acrobat and doing 3D, spending hours just learning my craft. Uh, But again, these things came naturally to me because, you know, as a photographer, I can see spaces, I can see lines. I love lines and landscaping. I love angles. Um, And when you're designing a room, I mean, you're dealing with lines and angles. So again, it was just a natural progression of using the skill that I currently had to just, you know, do more and, and get better and i got really good at it i was like wait a minute i can really do this so pretty interesting career at crit and barrel did really well there and then i moved on to another company then the design skill became a higher demand because now you're dealing with higher end luxury furniture and different clientele different beasts different nature um not to say that crit and barrel is bad but you know there's i mean when you go from a honda to an acura to a mercedes-benz there's a certain level of clientele that you're going to approach that you know, don't match, or, or there's a very big disparity between the two. So again, still with design, still photography, and anything. And if, if I could go back to Crit and Barrel for a second, Crit and Barrel actually was a key moment for me as somebody who, I'm not, I'm not a chef, right? But as a culinary artist, as I like to say. Right, I was like, when did that happen? <laughs> right, no, no, right. and, and that's, what, that's, that's why I went back to it. Um, um, my, dad's a, my dad's a chef, my mom's a caterer, they, they both have their own businesses. So I've been cooking since I was about three or four. I've always cooked. Like, like I will never go hungry. I mean, <laughs> I will never. There will always be a meal for you. <laughs> there, always, 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 always. I mean, as long as I have three key ingredients, a protein, a carb, and a vegetable, uh, I'm going to be fine. Having that basis as, you know, being a culinary artist, somebody who had parents who loved music and pictures, you know, those, those key seeds were embedded in me. They just grew progressively over the years and, and, and they came naturally to me. Being at Crit and Barrel fed every single beast in me. Wow, um, um, the, the, the design aspect, Crit and Barrel, as you know, they do, um, you know, plateware and so on and so forth. So to be able to, you know, after a long week, buy, you know, wine glasses or see the demos 
for people that I doubt interested to me. And they encourage you to always visit other departments so you can actually learn about that. And it just, it just kept on feeding me, feeding me, feeding me. And as somebody who does, you know, catering events, culinary events, like my parents did, I just kept on continuing with that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are a lot of moving parts. A lot, yeah, of, a lot of key... that led to you being a wine enthusiast. Yes. So one of the things about wine, which is where I'm at right now, and I love, love, love the wine journey that I'm on right now, is that I would always have to outsource, you know, that wine business to somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to pay for the bottles. I would have to make my menus and have somebody curate accompanying wine menu for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that cost a pretty penny. Of course. So with the amount of wine that I consumed, um, <laughs> I, I got introduced to a Malbec. And I was like, wait a minute. You know, this, this can work with this. And, you know, my, my dad and I started to converse. And the food conversations that my dad and I had about wine parents actually got us closer. If my dad could talk to anybody about food out of his four children, it's always going to be me. Oh, my gosh. I love that. I love that. Right? So not only was I forging a new career path, so to speak, from an entrepreneurial perspective, the fruits of that increased the conversation with my dad and myself. My dad doesn't talk about it often because he, it's a, it's a part of his life that it's just one of those things, right? You know, so it's not, you know, it's a past, so let's just move on. But it was a very instrumental part because I, I love being in the kitchen with my dad. Right, yeah. You see what I mean? Um, so fast forward, you know, Later on, I had my first glass of Malbec. It's not the regular stuff. Like, what is this, right? And I had an ex-girlfriend of mine. She's like, do you really like this? I was like, yeah, I really do. So I just, again, started reading books, started to go in wine tasting, started to go to events. And it was just one of those things where it just snowballed, it snowballed, snowballed. And that's where I'm at right now. Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. I design, I create, I cook, and I sip, <laughs> right? literally. I feel like you should um, add, you know, um, Somalia to that. I finally decided that I'm going to focus on France and South Africa mm-hmm. as my regions of choice because one of the best red wines that I had in years was from South Africa, and it was absolutely, absolutely amazing. Like, I was like... I. I had to sip it slow because I couldn't I couldn't understand what, what was going on in my mouth. And if there's if there's one thing that, that happens as you continue to drink wine, you don't drink wine to get drunk at this point. You drink drunk for you you drink wine for the experience, right? Oh my gosh, um, in my head right now because that's right. what I've always said. And as the years have passed, I never used to drink wine in my earlier years. And not that like because I feel like I'm still in my early years, but <laughs> definitely <laughs> later. But I was never this big wine person and then as time went on you know as I got into my 30s I started to to see this as as a part of the culinary experience yes you know? and I loved that right and and I loved that that it wasn't this um it wasn't this huge foreign thing because in Haitian culture, um, children, like in French culture, are exposed to wine with dinner and it's not seen, you know, not every night at all, but, you know, special occasions and it's not seen as this this big foreign thing. Whereas, exactly. Um, in the exactly. United States, it's like my American friends, it, it was such a big deal for them to turn 21. And this is where culture plays a huge part. It was such a big deal for them to turn 21, not for the sake of turning 21. And this is not every single person, but what I overwhelmingly heard was, oh, now I'm legal to drink. And 
And so for me and a lot of my Haitian friends, when we turned 21, and a lot of my European friends at that too, um, that was just a birthday to be celebrated, but not for the sake of, oh, now we can have drinks because we've always had that. And right. so our parents made it an experience to be shared amongst the family. So it was a cultural experience. It was a familial experience, but it wasn't something like, you know, everybody get keggers, you know, <laughs> on Saturday. Right. I mean, it's, 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 and it, it's funny that you say that because um, I remember one one of the pictures that one of the pictures on Facebook that you like often that you joke we joke about is the one where I'm holding a champagne glass. Yes. And, <laughs> and I think I think I was about three or four. For me, champagne will always be my favorite libation of choice because yeah. it's all it's always celebratory. It, it signifies to me anyway. It, it signifies celebration, and I will always I will never say no to a glass of champagne, cava, or sparkling wine. So even at that young age, when, when my friends were excited about, you know, being 18 to buy alcohol, I was like, guys, I've been drinking since I was four. Not to say that, you know, I was alcoholic. Right. That sounds but, funny. But, <laughs> but you know, but, you know it's but, been part of your experience. Exactly, exactly. I mean, like when my mom would set the table for dinner, there was always a wine glass on the table, whether it was, you know, apple cider or, you know, exactly. uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's so for me again. It's the natural progression. I mean, it's funny now because um, my girlfriend and I are very much embedded, and she mocks me all the time, all the all the time. And she says, "So you're gonna pair the food tonight, are you? Aren't you?" Okay. And I'm like, I "Yeah." <laughs> See what I mean? So it's it's. I, I mean, it, we we say it jokingly, but she is very much aware of my passion for it, and and we do we do wine based things together. So my wine tasting process is two prime, right? I'll buy the bottle of wine. And just sip it. We'll, you know, we'll, you know, we'll discuss characteristics, notes, and so on and so forth. And then I'll think of a menu that will, that will, you know, will, will work with it. Whether I have to cook the wine with it, mm -hmm. or separately, or even make it a two-course meal. Like I haven't gotten to a point where I'm pairing wines yet for a three-course meal. So I, I try to keep it for an entree just now because I know once I do that, I have to increase my <laughs> my budget <laughs> for, for wine. But you know, with this terrible roommate, I have to stock my wine now. <laughs> you do. You really do. Right. <laughs> food for me is very personal. I don't break bread with everybody. Uh, I would rather right. sit in right. a restaurant I, by myself. Can you say that one more time because I do not different. break bread with everybody. I it's food. As I've gotten older, food is food has become an intimate place for me. Yeah. Um, the people wow. th that surround with me, I have brokered very good business deals around mm -hmm. dinner. Some of my greatest conversations have been around food wine, breakfast, brunch. So I'm very particular about, I eat out often, I cook and so on and so forth. So if my girlfriend and I go out to dinner and we're trying a new space, you know, it's either date night or we've said, you know, we've, we want to try this restaurant. We have a list of spots that we want to go to, especially now that I'm in the DC DMV area, there's a plethora of up and coming um, restaurants that we want to try. Absolutely. So for us, it's an experience, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to sit in a restaurant with 12 people that I kind of sort of like. I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to, I want to be able to be around people who I love. Right. right? I, and I and that's, that is, yeah. Right. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that also too is why I prefer to do smaller scale dinner parties yeah. than the massive three to 400 catering events even though i mean those pay well and, it's, and for me at this particular point it's not even about the money it's, it's, it's about the experience one of my good friends kel spencer who is the creative officer of playtime and he and i speak very often and he always says to me you got to give the people an experience and when i talk to clients at work when i'm designing spaces talking about money is easy right talking about furnishing is easy but people don't buy what you have they buy who you are Oh, say it again. People don't buy, you know, what you're selling. They buy who you are. They're going to remember you and you have to give them a reason to remember you. So shout out to my Playtime family who are listening right now. It is really yeah. about the experience and you have to be able to foster a consistent experience for somebody to remember you by. So whether it's my... out there for you. It's sure, go ahead. Something, it's a quote Maya Angelou said, people don't remember necessarily what you said to them but how you make them feel right that that's my that's my spin on it i had to find a way to oh, but i love to, that spin on it to, to, to water it down so it's it's, it's that, that's what it's about so as i continue to grow professionally and personally each moment is about an experience i mean you know we don't know who or when is going to be our time to go right so every moment has to be magical 
Yeah. Every moment has to be significant, very um, intentional and, and, and try to live now with a sense of urgency. I'm in an amazing space right now in an amazing relationship. So for me, just all those things coming together naturally kind of just fall in line with mm-hmm. all the things that I want to do. And I want to clean up. There's usually a bottle of wine. I'm so sure. <laughs> there's, there's usually a bottle of wine. Um, you know, and, and has an experience. So that's a good foundation to kind of give give a segue to where we are right now. And I'm happy. One of the things that you can always tell, and I'm quite sure you can you can agree with this because because you you have probably more. I think out of everybody that I know, you have more French experience than I do. <laughs> so, 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 my next statement will be curated just for you. You understand, you understand what it's like for an intimate romantic experience, right? When, yes. especially when, it, especially when it's it's around food. Yes, yes, and yes, because you see what I mean. I really think that changes the game. Like it changes not only my experience in the moment, but the entire experience of the room, like mm-hmm. here, because I thought about how um, your parents, you know, introduced you, introducing you to food and travel, that was your, honestly, your passport for life and how you yes. seek to live now, right? And I know you pass that on to your own children. And what's so, so wonderful about that is that it is a bold thing to do. And people may not associate boldness with that, but it takes a lot to step out of our comfort zone, to go to different places. And food allows us you know, to partake of a different culture, to share in their experiences, you know, and to to really engage in, in different conversations. And that's why what I, I loved what you said about your dad, because, you know, he and you are able to bond and cross those generational gaps through your love of wine and food, right? And Absolutely. Even in relationships, you're mm-hmm. able to experience that with your girlfriend. And, and it's so funny that you mentioned champagne, cava, and Malbec, because I was like, <laughs> in my head, because I, Malbec is definitely my favorite red wine and champagne and cava just I love those because again the same reason it's celebratory and so for for instance with my husband before we started dating we were friends for a very long time right so we wouldn't go out to dinner per se like he'd have a barbecue and I'd go visit him and his friends and it was great but he also invited you to Keith key a key moment around food exactly exactly yeah. food was where our love story began right and, and as we you know started dating we would go to like spots just the two of us on date night where we try out a new spot so what you're saying evokes a lot of great memories for me mm-hmm. and even now um you know i introduced him to different types of wine and different you know i told him you know about the experiences and i'm gonna throw out a funny story one day we had a disagreement about wine glass <laughs> he brought oh boy. a bottle and then the, the I was infamous like, hey, conversation okay i was just like babe this is great i want us to experience this bottle together and the thing is yeah you sip it enjoy it be in the moment <clears throat> have conversation around it you know laugh talk you know and and so he brought <laughs> he's gonna be like why are you telling this story because it's important <laughs> so he brought this um he brought a white wine glass for the mm-hmm. red and i was like Oh my gosh. I was like, no, um, this is not the glass we should use for this. He's like, what's the difference? And so, you know, I, I was like, well, this is about the experience of this. And this is how, you know, you will experience the wine when it's in its proper glass and blah, 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 blah. And what was crazy, honestly, was that I remember one of my friends telling me the same story about her parents. She happened to be Haitian too, but telling mm-hmm. me the same story about her parents from like decades prior having right. the same experience and it was so funny but what ended up happening he didn't see the big deal at first and now he's just like oh we need the right glass for this or we need the right glass for that and i'm just like well if you bring the wrong glass you might as well just chuck it out of a bowl and, <laughs> and that's gonna just ruin it, it, it. It's, it it's it's funny <laughs> um it's funny you say that because i i have had many a conversation about wine glass i mean I, me personally i'm a wine glass snob it comes to red wines i like a big a big bowl, a nice long stem. Yes. Um, I like, you know, I prefer to have a regular flute versus a coupe for a champagne. Um, I'm not a big, I'm not a big white wine drinker. Mm -hmm. I'm still, I'm still learning to appreciate white wine. I mean, I have a few on my list that I really, really, really enjoy. White burgundies lately have really gotten my attention. And maybe a Sancerre, 
which is a nice white wine as well. But I'm I'm not really into white wines like that, even though I should be just for a wine drinker. I, I find that there's, and I know that I'm going to get some backlash for this, but I find that for me, there's like the exploration of reds mm-hmm. is so much more enjoyable because I, of the diversity of reds. I, I agree. I agree. I, I find I find um, I find whites again, and I'm probably gonna get I'm probably gonna get backlash for this as well. Uh, I find whites to be boring. It, it, I just to, to feel me, like there's not enough variation. And yeah, it's, it, okay. it's not. But but I but I but I will stand corrected. Um, last year, I had two very big, two amazing whites that I was like, okay, this is this is definitely noteworthy. And I have a friend of mine. Two um, in a whole year, you're proving my point. <laughs> well, you know what? Honestly, um, I mean, and this would be my suggestion for anybody who's into wine right now: drink and read, try out wines, just really find what your wine style is like. Mm-hmm. And and you know what? And I'm I'm going to give you this parallel to design, and I tell my design clients this all the time: finding your style is the hardest part. Once you find your style for your space, picking the fabric, the color, the layout is the easy part. Finding the style is the hardest part, especially for couples who live together. Because yes. my job is to marry, you know, his style with her style and vice versa. So if I could use the parallel to wine, find a wine that you like, find a region. You have to find, you know, that one region that's really going to get your attention. And then you explore deeper, you know, vintages. And we can go on from the A to Z's of, of what wine entails. But you, you have to sip and read. You, you sip it, you enjoy it, you study it, enjoy it, study it read up on it and that's how you extend your um wine literacy so to speak that is surrounded by you know wine and food yes you see what i mean yeah um, absolutely i, well, I have been... note, i want us to talk about cuba oh cuba. you know okay perfect segue um yeah. and it's, it's, it's funny it's funny you say that because um i just got back from cuba cuba mm-hmm. so cuba's been on my on my bucket list for years when i lived in montreal and i got here you know God bless my girlfriend, who is who 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 will listen to this and and be smiling and and pinching me at the same time when the smiling oh airs. I had what such did a you guys re- decide to go? Um, so I wanted to. I, I, I hadn't been out of the country um in several years, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And um, I knew that the 500th anniversary of Cuba was coming up, and mm-hmm. it fell in line with my birthday, which is in November. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of my really really good friends. Danielle, who is the founder of Absolute Cuba, she curated a trip, and I was like, oh, you know what, you know, let me, like, you know, forget, let me, let's just do it, right? And the more, the more I read up on Cuba, um, the more I was like, all right, I want to go. But also too, it, I needed a break mentally and just kind of, you know, unplug from from from. I, I needed to unplug and reset, mm-hmm. and um, Cuba was the right fix. Cuba was the right fix. And um, we could pro- we might have to do another podcast for um, Cuba how, Zero. <laughs> how how amazing mm-hmm. um, Cuba was. Cuba for me um, a- allowed me to. I mean, you saw the images that I took from my from my series that I did. Yeah, um, I and, and 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 ironically enough, I I only decided at the very last minute to bring my camera with me. Are you serious? Literally, probably maybe a couple hours before I had packed it. I was like, no, I won't. I was like, I, want to, I just want to go and enjoy it. And then at the very last minute, I said, you know what? Let me just, let me take it just in case. I'm so glad you did. Those pictures took me on a journey to Cuba with you, you know, and through those pictures that you took, which were beautiful, I felt like I was seeing just the, the vivaciousness of the culture the, the beautiful palette of the people, you know, and the food. And it just, I felt like it was an experience because I wanted to ask you this for so long. And that's, how did that feel for you going to Cuba, you know, particularly as a black man? And then I want to talk to you about, you know, your culinary experience there, but how did it feel for you as a black man, as a Haitian American? Because Cuba is this iconic historical place you know, with so many variations of people and Haitian people happen to live there as well. So what was that like for you from that level? That is actually um, a very interesting question. Um, I had went to Cuba with a lot of preconceived notions Mm. and they were all shattered as soon as I got in the airport. Wow. Right. The isolatory nature of Cuba from the rest of the world 
is probably their best asset. And I'll tell you why. They are allowed to nurture their own culture and mm -hmm. not have to be exploited by the Western world. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So you're not going to, we were there, isn't it McDonald's? <laughs> there is not out of Burger King. So, they, you know, I'm so used to all the countries having that. Right. It, it was, was weird. Mm -hmm. It was foreign for me not to see that. And as my trip progressed, I found that to be an asset versus liabilities for it not being there. So, you know, that that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Two, as a black man in Cuba, it probably was one of the best things that I did because as a black man, traveling is key. Yes. Yes. Because, because it, it indirectly allows me to become more intelligent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That you can't take my, you can't take that experience away from me. It's mine. Mm -hmm. Right. And through that experience, I indirectly benefit the people of Cuba because now I talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. I have probably had more conversations via inbox, via work, via food and wine about Cuba in the past three or four months than I have ever before, because I, it was, it was, it was definitely a, a needed experience. Mm -hmm. And to go back to my camera situation, I went there, once I committed to bringing my camera with me, there were very specific shots that I wanted to take. I didn't want to, I didn't want to overly inundate, you know, my camera with unnecessary pictures. Mm -hmm. I was looking for specific yeah. shots. I wanted, I wanted, I want to show certain areas that are normally not seen or behind the scene pictures of Cuba. And of course the food. You cannot tell me that you go to Cuba and have bad food. I will challenge you. I will challenge you from A to B until my face is blue. That is a lie. And you, should, you did not go with the right people or the right places. I did not have a bad meal, not one single time in the seven days I was there, not once. I had Michelin star food. So the, the, the last night I was surprised with a dinner party from a Michelin star chef. That experience, you know, to be in a space with him and him curating, like he, I was able to go in the kitchen with him and see what he was doing. I shook his hand, we spoke and, you know, it was just, it was just an experience. So I, I challenge anybody who ever says to me that they're going to Cuba and they had bad food. I'm like, you have to go back. And because of that trip, I'm actually hosting a culinary tour to Cuba in May. Look at that. Um, so, so now you become an ambassador to the country that you visited. Okay. Listen, it's, I mean, and it, it all happened because of that trip. And, you know, I, I'm very thankful for Danielle and her team because we talked about it. As a matter of fact, later on today, we're actually going to have a conversation about, you know, how to make that situation better. Mm -hmm. But they're not tied into social media like we are mm -hmm. here in the U.S. There is a social media presence, right? But however, they're not dependent on it. Mm. Right. So people are actually living like, you know, they hang out, you go to the beach and, you know, you're there at the bars, salsa classes, playing dominoes and having cigars. Just a really good experience to to have. I have nothing bad to say about it at all. Nothing like I really have nothing bad to say about it. That is um, fantastic. I, I, th I think I think the, the biggest the biggest caution that I will I, I'd share with anybody. And I, I say this again, don't expect the comforts of home mm. in someone else's yard. <laughs> oh wow that is a that is another that's a quotable one i love that because that's I mean? not a bad thing right it's not, it's not, it's not. Thing. and i re i remember i had an experience where um i went to the uk i went to london and i love mm -hmm. london i love it i love it so much my only issue was that i didn't want to see kfc i didn't want to see pizza hut i didn't want any of that and so but i knew that i would find amazing indian food and i found this right. whole hole in the wall and when you walked inside, it was, it was like, just transformed. It was like, I felt as if I was in India and, and, or at least had a taste of it. And it was beautiful. It was, the food was amazing. I will never forget that experience. And it made me more inquisitive about a food that I already liked. Like I liked Indian food, but because of that experience, I love Indian food. You know, and so that's, you know, that's where I found that it, it changed me, it, it broadened my horizons, but then it also made me want to learn more, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I love about, about experiencing culture through food, experiencing culture through wine, experiencing culture through photography and travel, you know, all of those things that you're doing, they all boil down to expanding your universe and expanding, honestly, representation of people like yourself, of people like myself. Right. When people see you, then they're also asking questions about you, right? And then you become, you know, 
the Haitian ambassador. You become, you know, ambassador for fill in the blank of photographers, of wine enthusiasts, of all of these things. And you get to share those experiences together. So this is my next question for you then, based on all of that. So with regard to diversity and inclusion, what clear goals has your exposure to other cultures help you establish in your work life and in your personal life? Based on all of that, how has it changed you and and how are you moving forward with that information? Well, I mean, that, that's another brilliant question, actually. You can't travel outside the world and, and come back the same. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong. I mean, I, I don't know how to articulate it well enough to, to share that, but you mm -hmm. can't visit another culture and not have it affect you. Mm -hmm. One of the key, okay, you know, and I'll give you a perfect example. Um, in Cuba, um, they put their rum in the fridge. Really? I, I, yes, they do. And now here at home, I put my rum in the fridge. I, the only thing that I would put in the fridge here is vodka. Like I like my vodka frozen. I, you know, I don't put any ice in it. So yes. Cuba, they put their rum in the fridge because you know that's just what they do. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's one. And uh, one of my other vices is um, is cigars. On a quiet night at home, you'll see me on the balcony just having a cigar, just you know, just unplugging, compa blaring at obscene levels, <laughs> right? <laughs> but and another thing that they do is they put honey on the lip of the cigar after you've punched it and cut it. And the reason why is so that way you can actually inhale the, the leaves and have a sweet taste to your lip. I never knew that. Wow. That's so interesting. Right? So for years, yeah. you know what, um, I've had flavored cigars. You know, I, you know I, I've been smoking cigars since about, I'd say, a little after college, been much of the Dominican Republic. And I've been, you know, as Haitians, rum is kind of embedded <laughs> in, 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 it is in, in DNA. <laughs> it, it is, it's in our DNA. So those two things have now changed to my favorite personal experiences in that sense. Mm -hmm. So when I take trips, my trip from Cuba specifically, because that's the most recent one I, I did, it, it forced me to slow down. It is definitely a conversation piece because people think Cuba is taboo and it's not. There, there are definitely ways to go and enjoy that country and it's not gonna cross your arm and a leg because it's a modern experience, right? How that has transcended to my work life is now I am more relaxed. Wow, okay. And I, I am naturally a talker um, mm -hmm. and sometimes I talk too fast, <laughs> but it's, it's forced me to slow down because number one, when I was in Cuba, I didn't speak Spanish, but having been around um, Spanish culture for a good portion of my life, you know, they speak, spac they speak, they speak fast naturally Mm -hmm. So I have to literally slow down and watch their hands and look at their mouths for the very little Spanish that I did speak. And that transcended in how I do with my clients now. Um, Cause client, I mean, people, we, we talk to, we talk sometimes just to talk, but we don't talk to listen. And it's forced oh. me to talk to listen. You see what I mean? Yeah. And you can, you can appreciate this as somebody who does what they do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, so on a daily basis, I find myself slowing down conversations that way I can, I can take in the information and also be very specific about the information that I'm giving out as well. Yes. And I think that is key. It really, it makes such a huge difference. And I love that you brought up that point. And I mean, I'm going to go back to another quote that I love. Um, and this, I'm not even ashamed to admit, I love Judge Judy. And <laughs> you know, she says, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. Talk, uh, well, so we can listen uh, twice as much as we talk. As we talk, I exactly. That amazing. And I find that the, the best conversationalists, the greatest speakers are the ones who do less talking and more listening. And I've, I strive to become that because I am a fast talker. So I know mm -hmm. that when I present to an audience, I have to slow down the pace of my speech because right. this is how I'll draw them in, you know, but I also know when I get very excited about something, I just go a mile a minute. Yes. I have to catch that. Right. Cause I know you, exactly. and I, especially I remember, you know, our days in college, just walking and chatting, like we would just be like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you yep. have to jump in if you wanted a room in that conversation. Right. Like right. Double touch. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. Cuba definitely told me to slow down. My girlfriend and I, we can literally sit at home, and have conversations for hours in the kitchen around food, glass and wine, music in the background and just talk. It made us closer together from a relationship standpoint. I'm, I'm sharing my business with you, but whatever. That's right, um, everyone. He's going to share it. <laughs> Cuba was definitely a, a big catalyst on the evolution of our relationship and friendship because it got us to be closer. And because we're both talkers, she's a teacher by trade. Mm -hmm. But when we're at home, we do talk, but you know, I've learned to, to slow down to listen to her 
and vice versa. Travel in general will allow you to expand your conversations with people who you love. And I think alter your communication style, right? Yes, absolutely. 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 And that's it, it, key to relationship building, be it personal or professional, right? Like my husband is not a talker by trade or by choice, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> so he communicates in a very different way and our personalities are opposite. Mm -hmm. But I love that we have the same foundation. And so that's why we work, right? Because we're like, we are literally from one end to the other spectrum. But I love that we can come together through travel, through discussions of things that we do love. And I'm a fast talker and he is a, a more uh, slower paced talker. And so that means, you know, if I'm going to catch up to him, I have to take some steps back. But also, I appreciate how he savors his words, right? Right. And, and how he's intentional about what he's saying. And so, you know, I also appreciate that he kind of prepares me for audiences without even mm -hmm. knowing it because, you know, um, I've written three books and he has been <laughs> the test subject for so many of the things I've written. Of course, and, I mean, he, of course he lives with you. Of course, exactly. of course he is. <laughs> and so he's an exercise, you know, our life is an exercise in diversity and inclusion because we're from two different cultures, you know? Right. And so, you know, we speak different languages. We have different experiences. And so, you know, I love... Our love of travel is what unites us. Our love of food is what unites us. So I completely understand what you're saying in that. And, and I just think it's an amazing thing to realize about yourself. So now, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's, it's funny you say that because, I mean, and you brought, you brought a, a key point. Um, so my girlfriend and I are from two different cultures. My, my girlfriend is American, Southern American. She's from Syracuse. It is fun to see not only the differences mm -hmm. in our relationship, but also to the things that come that are innate that we just do like out of like, well, yeah, you do that too. Oh snap. Okay. I do that too. Yes. So it's just one of, it's one of those things that, um, that makes relationships fun and, and allows you to grow in that sense. It's, it's one of those amazing things that I'm very grateful for. So I always say that, you know, diversity and inclusion honestly begins at home, right? Before we even step out of any kind of, you know, external space. It starts with the people that are looking right at you every day. So based on our conversation, tell us some things that you'd like for our listeners to know that would help them in their evolution and their journey. Travel, 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 travel. I mean, sometimes it just may mean traveling outside of your comfort zone. People don't travel to other countries because it's uncomfortable. Travel, because that's the only way you're going to get to know what you don't like. And even then with wine and food, the only way that you're going to know what you don't like with wine and food is by trap trying it. We can talk about the wines that I've had that taste like garbage <laughs> and cost, you know, anywhere from fifty to hundred dollars. And and I I've had some amazing wines and menus that cost me less than twenty five. Exactly. This is the beauty, I think, of going to different places, you know, and even yeah. for people who can't travel you know, to another country. That's the ideal, right? That's what we would want. But mm -hmm. travel outside of your neighborhood, travel outside of, you know, your state, travel outside of wherever it is that you are. I always tell, take a step further than where you normally go, right? Yeah, no, you know, and that's, that's actually a, 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 an excellent point. Um, it, it's, you see two steps ahead, mm -hmm. but you gotta think, you gotta think four. Right, because because yeah. because those first two steps can can easily lead to steps three and four, yeah, easily. Absolutely, absolutely. Right, um, and and that's actually how um, me becoming, I guess, you know, culinary ambassador for Cuba happened because I was open. the The amount of food that I had in Cuba was, you know, great. You know, it was amazing. The experience, the time, the people, and I'm going back. So yeah. you know, it's it's just one of those things that travel is great. It's dope in that sense because you you're exposed to to different things. I mean, like my my um my want and need to even cook better to drink wine better to drink wine differently to cook differently um happened because of that trip i'm tasting more i have three bottles of cuban rum in the kitchen that i'm anxious to crack but i have to wait <laughs> i have to wait because i know once it's gone it's gone forever but i mean outside of cuba um just just travel but if you can go to cuba i definitely i definitely suggest it um there's a lot there's more than meets the eye wow and, but I couldn't have said it better, like with regard to over our underlying theme of diversity and inclusion, there's more than meets the eye. 
And I'm hoping that when people listen to this particular episode, that it sparks that in them for those who have yet to travel, right? I hope that this continues to encourage them to travel. It really Definitely. is an amazing thing. It really Definitely. is. Definitely. I mean, if you, I mean, so I'm going to do a shameless plug. Really shameless quickly. plug. Be prepared, um, everyone. You, Here it comes. <laughs> if you are on, I mean, for those of you who are on social media, on IG and Facebook, the, the Cuba group that I'm a part of is called Absolutely Cuba on Instagram and also on Facebook. Tell us yes, all so of the social media channels. My photography page is JW Michelle Photography. My wine page is Wine with Wes on IG for Cuba and everything Cuba, absolutely Cuba on IG and also on Facebook. And I'm just going to throw out another plug for you there. Um, he's got a hashtag, Wes can cook. So <laughs> follow that. I'm a fan. <laughs> yes, Wes can cook is, is my hashtag and actually, I'm actually in the process of combining um, West Can Cook and Wine with West because wining and dining kind of fall hand in hand for me. Um, mm -hmm. So that should actually be happening over the next couple of weeks. But yes, um, my hashtag West Can Cook is where you will find all my culinary creations. But it definitely sooner than later will be combined with Wine with West as, you know, wine and food for me are just kind of hand in hand at this point. Excellent, excellent. So Jean Wesley, my friend, I want to thank you for being on the Global Fluency Podcast. This was so fun for me and it was just this wonderful adventure. So thank you for taking me and our listeners through this. And so for our listeners out there, you like what you hear, I know you do. So let us know. Be sure to visit the Global Fluence Facebook page. Send us messages at info at westgrouptraining.com. Let us know what you think about our interviews and your comments. And follow Jean Wesley on his social media channels. And continue having these conversations after you're done listening to our podcast. Share it. Let us know what you think about it. So thank you so much. And let's keep the conversation going. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.